testing, testing the volume for the live stream, testing on Champlain's voice, just making sure you can all hear me and see me okay, and just checking that the sound quality works when we're live streaming. Just being an armor, do we? Good afternoon and welcome to the Hermitage. <laughs> no, <laughs> is that loud enough? Do you need me to adjust anything? This is the 12th of March in the year 2016. And this is the Hermitage near Rosslan in North Wales. Okay, well, I think that's working. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. change from what you had for breakfast or counting. <laughs> 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 Hello, Jamie and Rose. This is Rinchen at the Hermitage. Jamie and Rose. This is Rinchen at the Hermitage. Thank <laughs> you. 
she is in hospital. Oh, yes. I can help you. And also, unfortunately, it might be a bit difficult for you sitting there with the camera. It doesn't block her necessarily, it's just, it, should, it might be alright. Okay, yeah, so there's no one else there, yeah. There's another lap over. Where is it going?
please stand for the Dharma teaching. <clears throat> Let's sing the um, verse to <coughs> Minoetta. Page twenty something, is it? Right. Namo Guru Hatha Vajraye. You see that everything in samsara and nirvana is merely dependently arisen. You see the Dharma cow of true being, that is the essence of all the dependent arising, the power of your great insight. Fills the universe with auspicious light. Almighty Shepherd Georgie, please rise up now from within my heart. You see that everything in samsara and nirvana is merely dependently arisen. You see the Dhamma Tower of true being. The essence of all dependent arising, the power of your great insight fills the universe with auspicious light. Almighty Shepa Dorje, please rise up now from within my heart. You see that everything is samsara and nirvana. It's merely dependently arisen. You see the Dharma Tower of True Being, that is the essence of all dependent arising. The power of your great insight fills the universe with auspicious light. Almighty Shepa Dorje. Please rise up now from within my heart. Jimela Shepa Dorje La Soa De So. Jimela Shepa Dorje La Soa De So. Jimela Shepa Dorje La Soa De So. Lord Mila, laughing Vajra, I call to you. Lord Mila, laughing Vajra, I call to you. Lord Mila Laughing Raja, 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 I call to you. Okay, so have we got lots of people there? Who's there? Online. Yeah. We've got Rose, we've got Aaron, 
we've got Jamie Jackson, we've got something called S Goose, and we've got Emma Thorne. Lots of people. Quite a few. Well, hello everybody. All right. So welcome everybody and everybody who's here. <laughs> All right. So this is a series, one of a series I've of talks I've been giving on the six paramitas, which is sometimes translated the six perfections. And they are, um, or sometimes paramita is translated as transcend, transcendental or, yeah, or perfection. So the, the six perfections or the six transcendental virtues or something like that. And uh, just for those people who haven't been following, and who might not remember or know that they are the, usually translated as uh, the first one being generosity, second one as um, discipline or something, something like that. Sometimes it's, yeah, and then the third one is uh, patience or forbearance, which is what we did last time. And this time it's. Uh, Often translated as perseverance. The word in Sanskrit is actually virya, which I'm sure is related to virile, virility, power, strength. So um, perseverance is part of that, but it's much more a sense of energy, joyful energy, at that. Whereas sometimes it's translated as diligence or it kind of sounds like very um, conformist, sort of doing what you should very earnestly. Whereas actually Virio is much more, it's letting it out, you know, you've got the energy and now you're using it. So how do you get the energy? It's a question really. And uh, the first three paramitas, if you like, are leading you up to that because it's not, Virya isn't any old energy. It's not just being very busy or getting on with it and sort of toiling away diligently or busily. It's, um, it's a certain kind of energy and, and it's, sometimes it's translated as enthusiasm for the good. So you, you really put your heart into applying yourself to realizing or enacting or embodying the good, the Dharma, if you like. So it's only certain things that you have enthusiasm for, and you have equal enthusiasm for abandoning the other things. So then you get the uh, situation where somebody who's busy, 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 Tibetans would typically call them lazy. Mm -hmm. because they're busy at things that have no avail. They're just worldly things, just increasing their attachments and what's a, you know, completely useless busyness, which stops them from creating the space and the time to develop real virya, which is love of the Dharma. So the English words don't capture that at all. If you put diligence or or perseverance or something you think it's a general quality but in in this context it's not a general quality it's only applicable to what's um, going to be conducive to happiness and finally liberation and if it's a paramita not just liberation for yourself but actually the liberation of all beings and not just any old liberation but complete and perfect goodhood so it's like enthusiasm for the the, mo the greatest and most in, um, all encompassing goal. So that would be your perfection of Virya. It'd be like the boundless energy of the Buddha or, or, or of your Buddha nature, you might say. So, um, how does this, uh, how, how do you develop this? You sort of think, oh, then I have to kind of build up, build up and get, put in lots of energy and get lots of energy going. But it's quite interesting because actually our nature is energy, is virya actually. Our Buddha nature is boundless energy. So uh, if we, uh, what are we doing that we're not expressing that? 
we, we're closing it down by our attachment to things and you know holding on to wrong views so that's why the first one first thing to to give rise to um viria is generosity giving that immediately opens opens you up and you do you i think everybody who gives really gives in a generous way realizes that was really uh, something very joyful in that and something very energizing in it so i think we've all got enough experience of that to think that might actually one might actually be able to go a long way with that and then of course you have to then be able to apply yourself to it's, this is where it's very similar to the next one which is sometimes translated even as ethics but it's like you decide this is called shila for those of you who know the um, sanskrit you decide you make a commitment and i will do this i will i will be generous i will give you know 10 pounds a month to some charity or whatever it is or whatever you've decided to do then the next quality or parameter is to do what you say you're going to do you know so you make a decision i'm going to do this much positive action and then you do it and then i'm going to give up doing these negative actions and you do it so that starts to sound well how's that different from viria then well you get started maybe doing a bit so you give up some of your bad habits and you start developing some good habits and you really start to build up your power what will stop that from developing any further is when you meet some problem or difficulty and you just stop so you think oh i'm going to be generous and then somebody says something you didn't like and you just put, you know <laughs> put your hands back in your pocket and think you know well if you're going to be like that so you're very easily put off so this the next one's shanti where you're not put off by anything you know once you've decided you're going to do something you do it and you don't let anything put you off so that means if some people behave badly to you you don't let that put you off you continue to be kind to them or you continue to practice in the way that you know the generosity you intended you don't hold that as a grudge you don't retreat back into yourself you just carry on being generous and through thick or thin you might say and then you think well hang on that sounds like the next one viria which is translated as perseverance you think so that's why perseverance isn't quite it because what happens is because of that gen generosity of your attitude and because of your being able to do what you say you can follow it through and that you can overcome difficulties and obstacles you find actually your mind is able to just engage in positive actions and dharmic actions almost effortlessly it's sort of you're starting to be carried along by that because what's happening is that they are actually natural it is a, it is a naturally we want to have the happiness that results from posi posi positive actions so when we do positive actions then we become more happy we become more enthusiastic to do more and that's where enthusiasm comes into viria because it comes out of that this is tremendous enthusiasm you can't get enough of doing good deeds or doing dharma practice you might say or understanding the true nature of the dharma or reality or going along the path to awakening or whatever it is you're calling it and this is what then leads to the next uh, um, parameter, which is of, you could say, meditation. You think, ah, oh, hang on. I thought Buddhism was all about meditation and you just practice meditation. But in actual fact, you've got this foundation of four parameters, that, uh, four qualities that you really need as a basis for meditation so of course if you sit down in meditation and you find nothing much is happening or you're you know you don't seem to make any progress you, you think oh maybe i have to meditate harder or maybe you need to look at these four foundations for the um developing meditation 
because these four foundations if you if you sit down and you can meditate then you must have those foundations in place if if you're very if you're very mean and won't open up then when you sit in meditation that's how you're going to be in meditation too and if you can't carry through what you're going to you say you're going to do then you're not going to do it in meditation either you're, you're not going to sit there you're going to find an excuse to jump up and do something else and if you if you're easily put off by anything you're not going to sit there either you're not going to stay in meditation because you'll immediately think of some problem or other and get involved in that so you need to have got those three to some extent but each one of them can be developed to the nth degree and as they develop to the nth degree they become more like each other because you know the, the greatest of generosity involves the ha having these other qualities of discipline and um, shanti patience and uh, virya so and virya again it can't really develop if you've got this really mean tight attitude towards the world you're not going to have much energy anyway so so you might try and meditate in a mean way but you know, <laughs> nothing much is going to happen so it's good to know that because often when we're talking about dharma practice and i often say this we tend to think oh i didn't have time to practice dharma because i didn't have time to sit down and meditate or i didn't manage to sit down and meditate or i didn't study anything actually practicing dharma is these six paramitas so did you not have time to be generous or kind what i mean you're always having opportunities to be generous and kind to people even if it's only simply to give another person some of our time so we, we've always could be practicing like that we can always be following through on what we said we do to help and perhaps we think we're not practicing dharma because we're too busy maybe looking after somebody well how can that be called too bit too busy to practice dharma that is dharma looking after somebody that's the that's generosity that's discipline that's shanti you need a lot of patience and forbearance so i mean what are you talking about you've no time to practice so it's really important to have this very positive attitude about what dharma practice is and that uh, we've always got time for it if we're breathing we've got time to practice dharma this is our opportunity as it were so how does this link with virya virya is this energy that starts to to come from the practice of dharma and it comes also from energy exchange so that when you you're entering the um the path of dharma like you've decided okay i want to take refuge in the buddha for example and you get behind that you really think yes yes i'm definitely going to do it you know so there's a kind of generosity in that you start with an offering to kind of energy exchange starts and then you start with the um you know you put your heart into it this is what you really want this is your heart wish of being expressed you get behind it you put your energy into it that's actually the beginning of i say the beginning but it's really drawing on and um, and um, empowering your your own energy period your your mandala now becomes very powerful it's supported by all the other practitioners and enlightened beings so it's empowered by that and you can actually in a sense relax more and by relaxing more more energy comes through because you have more you could say faith you have more faith you have more confidence that i can rely on something i can rely on this so i'm, I'm sort of trying to show to some extent how the um principles in discovering the heart of buddhism are actually without mentioning it is laying the foundations for the practice of the six paramitas including mandala principle and even more so when you realize your real heart wish is that all beings be happy that they all reach the highest happiness that they won't fall away from because they've gone into complete awakening 
so when when that kind of you connect with that in yourself and you connect with that in all the enlightened beings who already realize that and already live like that and are that you're entering into their mandala and you're empowered by that mandala you actually corresponding amount of energy comes into you so that by thinking of them and their what they've done before that energizes you to feel enthusiasm for that and the enthusiasm for it is what helps you to actually get behind it and um follow through on that so it's this everything is feeding back into your energy so although it's called perseverance in this translation calls it perseverance which is as good a translation as any because there isn't one that's perfect as i said some sometimes it's um diligence i looked up diligence because i thought when i hear diligence i hear i hear industriousness and I remember I was always called diligent. The, the, the Tibetans always say, oh, she's so diligent, she's so diligent, or whatever word it was. But there's a Tibetan for Virya, which is Tintitsitujimba. And I thought, I wasn't quite sure that was a good, was a good quality. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'm a bit obsessive or, you know, like, um, um, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm just simply egocentric in a way of just trying to just trying to kind of be the best performer around here you know like be as good as the next person you know i mean it doesn't necessarily have to be following through from a good place so that they were obviously um choosing to interpret what they were seeing as being virtuous you know that it was coming from a good place and that i noticed that with tibetans when they're practitioners they don't um, they don't sort of look at other people in a cynical way thinking well they look industrious or they look as if it's virtuous but it's probably egocentric which i think we tend to do in the west whereas they would have a very strong cultural tendency to think well there's no point in my thinking that because then i don't make any i don't make any punya i don't make anything i don't make any virtue out of thinking they may not be as good as they look but I do get virtue if I think they're very good and I'm inspired by that, even if they're not. And this is actually, um, it does a lot for their sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> so they will tend to exaggerate the good qualities. You know, you know, if you're talking to that, and they're, they're very happily exaggerate your good qualities endlessly because, because of this, because they think, well, it, you know, by my thinking, you have those qualities. Those qualities arise in me. So thank you. So I, I'll think you're as good as you know, as you might be. <laughs> and then you know, when you tell them, well, I'm not that good, really. They say, well, isn't that good? I didn't know that, but nonetheless, I made lots of punya from thinking that you were that good, and I, I shall continue to do so. It's really nice. It's a very nice attitude because it's very. I mean, it, obviously, it's a human trait because the Buddha, right from the beginning, was always giving practices to overcome that kind of feeling of, you know, jealousy and envy. And, you know, even when somebody's doing something good, you know, when I see it in myself, that somebody's done something good and I'm feeling about it, I think nobody in the whole world would have such a bad negative thinking because it's so stupid but then i realized looking at the text and everything it's just standard that's what we all do that's why we need to have an antidote to it but uh, we tend to see the good done by others and think that we that's some sort of criticism of us it's very common isn't it and so because we see it as a kind of showing us up and some sort of criticism of us we try to think well maybe they're not as good as they look I think our society is full of it. You know, if somebody's good, then we're all out looking for the faults, how they're not really as good as they are, which is so stupid because we don't make any anything positive. That doesn't help us at all. So um, yeah, I think that needs revising in the way we go about our public life, really. 
it's not it's not difficult and it's not clever to see faults in other people and it's useless it doesn't it does you no good whereas it there is something very uplifting and energizing in looking to see the good in others and aspiring to it and and you know in a way even exaggerating it and there's nothing like somebody else seeing you as good to actually bring out the good in you so i mean socially it's much better for society for, for to be to encourage yourself and others to look for the good in others so that that good arises in arises more and more in in yourself and in others and this would be exactly what viria is about that en augmenting energy arising from well the translation <laughs> It's really awful because you can't find the right words from the Sanskrit or Tibetan into English. So the, the word they use is virtue. You're rejoicing in virtue. And unfortunately, I don't know if anybody here finds the word virtue uplifting. Does anyone find the word virtue uplifting? No, there's no enthusiasm for virtue. <laughs> it depends how you use the word. It does depend how you use it, but um, generally speaking, it, it doesn't have the resonance of that. Um, in Tibetan, for example, they use the word gewa, uh, which in Sanskrit is kushala, which is variously translated as wholesome, skillful, virtuous positive sometimes i translate it as positive karmic action because it gets a little bit more of the meaning into it but um in tibetan gewa it just resonates you just hear the word gewa and you feel happy you know it, it's it's the source of happiness it's um yeah it has it yeah it's sort of auspicious even you know you, you feel Oh, that's a sign everything's going to be good you know everything is good or this is something something i know in my heart is good it's gewa whereas virtue doesn't immediately in any context just trigger that kind of response so we're, we're lacking that and as a translator i feel i never feel happy translating something that is all based on that word having that impact right at the beginning because however I translate it, it's going to sound a bit like, I don't know, a somewhat... Doesn't it sound a bit Victorian? Yeah, exactly. It sounds a bit like judgmental and, um, yeah, uptight somehow. So and The Greeks believe that virtue is, is our, our quality, not only quality. Yes. But they indicate, and I understand from yeah. those teachings, a notion about the right action. Want right. to have the right action behind whatever and the right is. result and the right result it will lead to happiness so it's, it's inseparable from happiness so the tibetans can't really understand that when they say something like virtue it doesn't relate to happiness or to you know because the word in tibetan does so, so um you need to make some new words well we need to create a context because the words need to resonate right I, I don't know what you can say i mean we tend to say for example well you're lucky and that has a sense of oh you know you've got some good fortune but it seems like a bit unfair really you've been lucky <laughs> you know? but whereas in in tibetan for example if you were to say someone has sonam which is a result of gewa You'd say oh you know you're lucky but what they'd be saying is you must have done something to give rise to that and i'm i'm rejoicing in that so that that quality arises into me and then that would be good for me too so it's got a whole different resonance to it to say you're lucky but often tibetans don't you know they ask well what's the word in english for sonam and they're told lucky and then they might say oh you're very lucky thinking they're saying something else but you know what can they do and it's very hard for them sometimes to to really understand that our word lucky doesn't have the same connotation as their word sonam especially because when you learn something for the first time you know like if you learn this is the word for that 
and you've believed it, you can't really understand that you're not saying what you think you're saying. <laughs> so I run into this difficulty. First of all, myself, what I'm going to say, but then if you have to translate for a Tibetan who's teaching, who's thinking he's saying things that I can't find a way to translate it to say what he's saying. It's like a, I prefer to have more space to just share with you some of the um, those kind of connotations. So that this virya, so that we don't need new words, we can just steal the Sanskrit well, ones, can't we? What about goodness? What, for, for virya? For virtue, instead of virtue. Well, I mean, goodness doesn't... Goodness is better than virtue, isn't it? Yeah, it probably is, yeah. I, I usually translate it as positive karma, mm -hmm. because although karma means the action, it does imply the result because of the way we hear karma. So, um, so yeah, gradually we'll find words. So what was I saying about virya? Okay, so virya is given as the opposite of laziness but in this special sense um, and you have to have virya in order to reach enlightenment you need this energy if you're going to overcome your habitual wrong views you're going to need persistent persevering <laughs> application and energy and you've got to find that from somewhere so typically what um tibetans practitioners are given to do is to meditate on the four thoughts are any of you familiar with these four thoughts anyone yeah you're familiar with that yes right so uh you if you read the life story of milarepa when eventually marpa decided to teach him he put him in retreat and he basically told him for, to sit for nine months reflecting on these four thoughts which Milarepa diligently did. And the first one is, and they, they are to give rise to um, virya, actually. To kind of, the first one is reflecting on your precious human birth. The reason I don't give this to people right off is because the way the precious human birth is described assumes that you've taken on board all sorts of ideas about the nature of the universe that um, you probably haven't. So I need to have, a, I have to get a step before that even. What's brought you here? Why do you want to put your energy into thinking about Dharma at all? And that's the kind of thing I've been talking about. But typically what you'll be told to think about is it's very, very rare to, to be in a situation where you want to hear Dharma anyway. Most, I mean, you could say, if you included all the kinds of beings that there are, even the ones we know about, if you think about, you know, every life form on the planet, how many of those life forms are interested in Dharma? So you might think, well, hang on, that's a bit, that's a bit too much for me. I can't take that in. But you might think, well, how many people are interested, really interested in Dharma and, and who would want to come and um, discover the path of, to enlightenment? I mean, how many of your friends do for example or any your acquaintances or you know like okay over the course of my life it's increased in this country but uh, generally speaking far fewer than are not interested at all and then even those who are interested how many of them are really seriously interested or actually apply themselves to any extent you know and, and you you go through the qualities you know, and how many of them actually really understand it to any significant degree and and how, how many of them you know got even as far as i've got you know however far we haven't got <laughs> wherever we are so when you think about it you think well you know that's maybe it is special but of course if you don't believe in past and future lives it doesn't have much significance because you're not thinking, well, how come I've got it? So that, again, I, that's why I don't stress it very much, because first of all, people have to kind of open up to the possibility they might have 
done things in past lives which have been resulted in them being here now which then might motivate them to think well if i want to continue with this i better keep going with what I, what good i must have been doing in the past well of course that all works very logically if you accept various fundamental principles about cause and effect and the nature of the universe which maybe you have you haven't even haven't even begun to think in those terms so that's why i don't I don't start there, even though there's nothing wrong with it as a starting point if, you know, if that works for you. So the next thing, that, you know, they, to them it seems like really logical, but of course it's logical as long as you accept the premises that, of course, they haven't arrived at those premises by logic. They've accepted the premises because they've accepted that the Buddha taught this way and this is their teachers teach this way therefore it must be right so on the basis of that logic i can work out that i must have done actions good actions in the past and you know if i do them now then i'll get the results in the future so then the next thing you think about to get your theory going to get yourself to apply yourself and to stop messing about is to think it's impermanent it could disappear anytime and that you know it's easy to forget that. It's very easy to forget. It, it's all hanging on a thread. If you think about the delicate structure of our body and how it depends on everything being working exactly right, it only takes a little thing to not work right. And we could just drop dead just like that. It's easy to forget that. Partly because if you remembered it too much, you'd never do anything, would you? <laughs> you have to sort of plan as if you're going to be here even if there's no you know it, there's always a chance that you're not going to be here the next minute or the next day or the next week or year or whatever so you have to hold the two really you have to kind of make plans as if you're going to be there knowing full well you don't know you've no idea and the the reason for contemplating that in this context is to develop virya, enthusiasm for dharma because you think i can't hang around and can I, I'll practice Dharma or I'll apply myself to Dharma or I'll listen to the Dharma or whatever. I can't think I'll do that later because there might not be a later. So if you think about that enough, you find the energy to get on with it now. And as I said, it doesn't mean that you have to go off and do anything different. It just means apply Dharma to what you're doing now because this might be your last chance. So whatever you're doing now, you can apply the six paramitas to it, can't you? You can apply good motivation to it. You can apply your awareness and, uh, and your aspirations to it so that it becomes dharma here and now because you don't know if there's going to be time later. And that's that can be a very powerful way to cut through our tendency to drift off and let ourselves be distracted by things. So you can see how that relates to meditation now, can't you? That if you've got that strong sense, I can't waste time, because I might be dead before I know it. And now I have the opportunity, I'm going to use it so that I will get that opportunity again in the future. Best insurance policy to get it in the future is to apply myself now. Now, what, what's happening in my mind? What are my negative thoughts? What am I doing about them? What are my positive thoughts? What am I doing about them? How can I increase them? How can I reduce the negative? You could do it as soon as you remember impermanence. You can start to think like that. So it, it can be very energizing. So the next thing they get you to think about, this is what Milarepa would have been meditating on all day. You know, he'd be sat there 12 hours a day probably, two, two, four two and a half hour sessions, if not more. Just thinking about this, and I, I often wonder to myself how you can how you can work up enthusiasm to think about the same thing, you know, four times a day for nine months, you know, and nothing else. So how do you do that? How do you actually how do you actually manage to contemplate these things so deeply? And I think you must be able to. You must be able to link into some kind of real faith that this is true and be able to relax into that and to feel, have lots of feelings of like gratitude and 
and then fear and fear of you know losing this opportunity and sort of joy at having found it and gratitude to your teachers all sorts of you know it could be probably quite passionate reflection going on and uh, of course again a lot of energy in that so uh, i think we're missing a trick there perhaps but oh, not all maybe but some of us So that's the impermanence one. And they do tend to stress meditation on impermanence in those terms. I mean, there's many ways you can meditate on impermanence. Uh, but this is the one that they stress because they're trying to get your virya going. The next one is suffering. Is it? It's called karma next. Karma next, that's right. I'm sorry. That's right. So then the next one is to really reflect on again it's the teachings but you might have some enough in your own experience to 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 reinforce what you've learned but you're told well um you use this human life you use this opportunity you have now to determine where you're going to be born so if you want to have happy lives following on from this one then do virtuous actions do those actions which will result in happiness. So then you're given, you know, Buddhists full of very good lists. So they have the 10 positive karmic actions and the 10 negative actions. But, you know, they're not stuck with just 10 actions, you know, positive and negative. I mean, if you look in the scriptures, you find loads of lists of what the good actions are and what the negative actions are but the ones that's become standard really especially in the tibetan tradition are the the um 10 virtuous are called you know, or positive actions and the, and the 10 negative actions so of body speech and mind those are um body ones are the negative one is to kill and the positive one is to save life and then it, the next negative one is to steal and the uh, positive equivalent is to give and the next one is to um sexual misconduct which um the positive is equivalent of that is to use your sexuality in order to benefit others to bring happiness and then the um Taking intoxicants, you know, not that would be negative because that, you know, that actually damages your ability to um, act positively. So the opposite of that would be to practice um, sobriety, you know, like you're in control of your senses. And then, so those are the body ones. And then the speech ones would be, um, I just managed to get, was that three or four? You put intoxicants and they are not in list of 10 usually. Ah, right. But okay. Now you'll have your So I'm getting my lists modeled up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so there's four of speech and they, they are um, um, harsh speech and the opposite of that would be gentle speech, truthful speech, opposite, your lies, opposite would be truthful speech. Then um, divisive speech, putting setting people against each other, and the opposite of that is harmonious, bringing people together and creating harmony. And the last one, which is uh, useless speech, that just <laughs> wastes everybody's time. <laughs> and then you know, um, using your speech skillfully to benefit others. So that uh, and Ken Primshe is always careful to include jokes. <laughs> jokes are not they're not useless chatter they have a very positive function <laughs> um so you know you could talk about these positive and negative actions a lot because you know often we we're struggling with these you know whether we are acting positively or negatively or how to change our negative actions into positive actions or more positive habits and so on which is a good thing to be thinking about and of course as long as you're thinking about that you are actually practicing dharma and your virya is increasing because your enthusiasm for the good is increasing as you think about it 
So it's good to be thinking about it. And then the mind ones are um, the negative would be ill will and the positive would be goodwill. The negative one is um, greed and, you know, Covetous. covetousness. Yes, oh, that's a nice word like that. <laughs> and the, um, the positive one would be, oh, would be generosity, wouldn't it, and, and giving. Oh, actually, I think they usually say um, being satisfied with what you have. And then the last one is um, having views that essentially just <coughs> sometimes they say non dharmic in the sense that they, they don't co they don't correspond with what's true. You know, they're wrong views in the sense of they're just views that are not conducive to the dharma, and then they're not they're not in line with the truth. And you're holding on to these views and they're blocking your understanding, your ability to understand. So you need to drop those views and then develop views that are in <coughs> harmony with reality and truth. And obviously that's something you're going to have to work on. But at least you could start with an openness towards listening to the Dharma, listening to where and, and being willing to change your mind and cultivate. Um, views that are in harmony with the Dharma, which in a way is quite interesting because ultimately you drop all views. So the, the ultimate view is to not have any views, which you know you have to work on because that's um that's not that, that means you actually completely change the way you are knowing anything. So it's it's a it's a spiritual accomplishment really to go beyond all views. But that gives you a sense of what's being talked about when you're having enthusiasm and energy to pursue positive karmic action would involve being very clear about what positive karmic action was, which of course takes us back to the Shila Paramita, which we talked about earlier. But it's worth remembering that, that um, perhaps when you studied the Shila, it didn't occur to you that by reflecting on Sheila on the actions, what are positive, negative actions, it would increase your enthusiasm and wholeheartedness about practicing Dharma. But again, I think as Westerners who are not particularly starting off on the assumption that these actions, we're going to reap the results of them in a future life, we tend to reflect on them somewhat differently, at least to start with as what's the effect of them now. And the good news is, and this was at the time of the Buddha too, the Buddha pointed this out. The good news is that actually you can see now the effect of positive and negative actions. So anger, you could say, well, it'll lead to you the lower, it, birth in the lower realms in future lives. And you think, well, who knows? But then you say anger means you can't sleep properly and you're feeling very upset and you lose your friends and you waste a lot of your time and energy. And you see, you know, that's true. I can see that now. I, I can see that's not wise, actually. So that's the good news. You don't have to take on a belief that, you know, you think, well, I, I don't know if it's true or not. You don't have to take it on board, really. You can, you can see enough now in the results of your actions immediately. But it does become relevant sometimes because sometimes you're doing an action which is positive and you know it is, but it seems to be having a negative result, you know, like being kind to your children. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it doesn't seem to be having a good result. And, you know, and then you might doubt, well, am I doing the right thing? Maybe I should beat them more. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever and then you might think well is beating good or bad now tibetans would say it's good and they do it, and they do it with good motivation so you know they will actually be making positive karma because they're doing out of, out of love and often tibetans tell me yes my parents beat me out of love they believe it and so it becomes true actually so you know very strict things about right or wrong it's it can sometimes help a lot to, to have that sense that I'm doing it because it's the best I can do and with a good motivation 
it will have a good effect at some point, even though I can't see anything good coming from it now. And there's loads of examples of that. And I find that's where I find it really helpful to have this context of at least being open minded about future lives. Because then I think, why should I think that the good I put into my life now won't have an effect in the future? And I want to act in this good way now. You know, it feels right and I want to. And even if it doesn't have an effect immediately, I like to feel it will one day. So I remember um, reading Trump and Pache's book where he said when they were leaving Tibet, and they knew that it was near the end. He said, we started building a new college, I think it was, knowing full well it would never get finished because they felt because the good karma of being, creating some new college in the future, you know, will we'll actually bring that good karma to this place in the future. Kind of, and maybe I didn't express that very clearly, or it wasn't a very good example, but. It's a good laying, example. Laying foundations. Yeah. Yes, even though it might not yeah. have a result here and now. Mm. I did that with this intention, and maybe it will result in something here and now, which it won't, but it might. In the, and maybe not in this lifetime even, but it, at some point, that's what I, that was my intention and that's what will be created or if we did it together. We intended to do this together and that's what we will reap the result of in a future time. So if you plan to build a, a you know, Buddhist college together and you put a lot of energy into it, then in a future time, those conditions will come together and, and you will build something very positive and useful in whatever world it happened to be that you came together again. So, you know, I, I find that really, like often people put a lot of time and energy into a good cause, you know, and they're working and they can get, sometimes they see it going wrong and they blame other people and they get very angry and feel these other people have actually ruined everything that they did tried to work for and and out of that grows a lot of aggression and a lot of hatred and anger and disappointment so that actually what was really positive turns into something really horrible whereas if they thought to themselves well i'll just carry on putting good into this as much as i can because eventually this will have a good result somehow it will result in something good whereas if i start fighting and bitching and you know kind of blaming other people that will have a negative effect now but also in the future it spoils the chances of it ripening in the future and psychologically you can feel much more positive if you feel the result you can't control the result i can only control what i put into it and eventually you have that psychological sense of yeah it, it's all going to work out in the end even if not here and now so but again it's I, you know, I can't say that I can see, you know, the results of karma in the future lives. I mean, but as I realise that my usual materialistic way of thinking doesn't make any sense at all, my mind does open up more and more to the gut feeling of meaningfulness that is there when you do think in terms of actions do result do follow it on even after this body's died. Thinking like that gives my life now far more meaning. So what have I lost <coughs> actually by keeping open to that way of thinking? So then the last one that you think about is, um, so that the idea of that is it gives you energy because you know it's not going to get wasted. So you don't get discouraged. You carry on doing good. You carry on doing good because you know it won't be wasted, even if you can see everything falling apart around you. Never mind, you just keep going because you've got the energy to do it and enthusiasm to do it because you're doing it for, for, this, uh, for the karmic result, if you like. And then the, third, the fourth one is really about moving into the paramita of virya because it's about thinking about suffering, but in a particular way. I mean, there's lots of ways you can contemplate suffering which are useful, but this, ex, this 
four thoughts are particularly about virya you know enthusing you and getting you getting you wholeheartedly and putting your effort into dharma and the idea is that if you think of the whole buddhist world view whatever as long as you're still caught up in the cycle of birth and death of samsara built on your grasping at the skandhas as real everything you do will end in suffering so if you contemplate that for long enough it's based really on the teachings because you can't really see this for yourself but you can start to get a stronger stronger sense it must it's, it feels like it's true you, you get as the more you practice the more you can see it must be true really i can't see any way that it's not true but you you contemplate that and you make that connection between grasping at the scandals as real and taking birth again and again and how hopeless that is and how you don't you don't want to be born anywhere all the different uh, places you might end up being born or states of being you might be born all of them are flawed and all of them are hanging on a thread and at any time you could go from one to another you know you can go from being in a god's realm into a hell's realm there's no nothing to say you couldn't do that very suddenly like you can see in our life you know we can go from one day being well and healthy with everything life going quite well to the next day you you can't move and you've lost your family i mean it, it happens around all the time i mean nothing even this human life is is not secure so the more you think about that you think i i don't want to i, I want out and and you get this tremendous sense of enthusiasm energy wholeheartedness about i i must get out and i must get others out too there's nothing else worth doing so these four thoughts are to get us into that state of mind when we when you know we go uh, in terms of applying the dharma to our lives so that we feel like somebody they, they use the example of a, a person with his hair on fire you don't hang about for a minute you immediately get on with trying to put it out so they and then and then this other lovely image they use is elephants going down for a mud bath in the heat of the day they rush down to the water with tremendous enthusiasm i love, I have this lovely image of elephants whoa, 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 you know, i'm going to get there first yeah. getting into the cold the cool of the mud so there's there's some nice images like that but <laughs> So this, that's what the four thoughts are supposed to, to engender, energy and enthusiasm for Dharma. It, they could sound like really miserable, because it could sound as if they're telling you, you know, life's not worth living, it's horrible in samsara, and you, know, look, it's, you think it's good, but it's actually ghastly. And I think the trouble for Westerners <laughs> is that because we've not got a very strong sense of connection, even in our language, between actions and suffering we can get sort of stuck into thinking oh how terrible samsara is how depressing it is rather than like elephants charging down to the mud pool in the heat of the day because we don't connect the two immediately on unnecessarily so we do need a bit of um we need to do a little bit of work on our whole world view really you have this very materialistic world view where there's only now this world that i can now touch and see and if the buddha tells me things beyond that how do i know they're true it tends to be where we start and perhaps stay for a very long time nonetheless it doesn't stop us practicing dharma but perhaps not with you know maybe it does you know block us from this fear and what we tend to use as a substitute is um if we do start getting active really enthusiastic and active it's a bit neurotic and it's a bit about you know like am i doing well enough or am i you know am i pleasing the teacher or am i getting on as good as my other students or or you know whatever kind of thing trick we lay on ourselves so that you can't be sure as western i mean you can't be sure ever but with anybody but i think as westerns it could easily 
fool a teacher into thinking that we were acting out of this tremendous sense of renunciation and faith when in fact it's not quite that and uh, then they're a little bit surprised when it starts to fall apart and they don't realize that perhaps we never did have the faith they thought we had you know i've seen it happen so many times and i think to some extent in various ways i mean i can't say that i'm not my it hasn't happened to me in some sense i think it's difficult because usually our, our motives are mixed aren't they but certainly when i first started out in india practicing dharma and they thought i was practicing the way they would be practicing but i wasn't because i wasn't sure about past and future lives or you know the ripening of karma or how it could happen or you know i i wasn't practicing because i believed that you know you could look well what was i why was i practicing well because i thought i would give it all the benefit of the doubt for a while and i had quite a lot of energy for doing that you know you think well but i think we can can't we you're told well it's all beyond words so you can't really tell you've got to t you've got to rely on a teacher who, who knows more than you do so, well, all right i go along what else do i have to do yeah, yeah okay i'll do that until you actually begin to realize I've got to have conviction myself. It's not going to work unless some conviction is arising in me. And then I had to kind of return to my um, the, the reality of my own Western background, really, and the effect of, yeah, especially when I have to talk to other people about it, I have to realize, well, if they're not, I was working with Tibetans in Tibetan, so I was picking up the resonance of their words. But when I'm teaching in the West, I'm not doing that. I mean, a little bit. I've introduced a few words for you. I introduced Duryea and Adishtana and Gewa a little bit. But nonetheless, most of the time, we're going to be speaking in English. And our English words will have an effect on us. You know, they will have connotations that will affect us. I've just got to... Um, work with what we've got and we've got a wonderful language you know, we, we've got a wonderful language with tremendous potential but we just got to have to be a bit careful to not make assumptions that words are going to have the effect in translation as that you know exactly the same way they're not going to work in exactly the same way so where was i was talking about the suffering of samsara and shifting from the motivation of thinking i want to have positive karma so i get positive results because i'm a, i don't want to suffer anymore in samsara to i don't want anyone to suffer in samsara like there's beings well the way the beings are described is there are countless beings limitless beings in every point in space when i first had to translate that i, th I think i've said this many times i thought it can't mean that it, there aren't limitless beings in every point in space so it must mean something else and i notice other translators do the same i've said this often haven't i that uh, we, we translated as as many as many atoms as there, there are as, there's many beings I can't remember. Just as that's it. Just as space has all has limitless. No, I can't remember how we do it. Filling the whole of space, beings filling the whole of space. Thinking just as space is vast, the number of beings is vast. That's what I thought it must mean, but now I think no, it means exactly what it says. Space is completely filled with beings, packed with beings. This is the Buddhist. This is the Buddhist view. There is no limit to how be, many beings there are, and we can only see a certain. You know, we see a certain world with a certain number of beings, and we think that's it. Mm. But that's just because of the you know our sense faculties that limit what we can see. So when you're talking about the Mahayana and about um, savoring all beings from samsara you're talking on a cosmic scale faster than anything even that science has discovered it's it's just so vast that 
you might easily feel, well, what could a little what could little me do about that? You know, what how could I, little me, say I could save all those beings? But then when you think about it, how could I, little being, think it could save anybody? You know, or two or three people or a dozen or you know, even all the humans in this world. I mean, we're not going to do it that way. If we're going to save all beings, it's got to be because the world and the universe is completely different from what we think it is. Which means if we're going to save all beings, we have to completely change our view on the nature of reality. And this is where we think, okay, I'm up for that. And we make the aspiration to realize what emptiness actually means. And we can't expect to realize that quickly. We can't expect that, well, I'll realize it and then I'll make the vow. Because until you make the vow, you probably, you're not going to realize it actually. So it's a um, chicken and egg sort of situation. So what makes you make a vow like that? Where without you making it blind, really, because you haven't realized emptiness. And yet, in order to realize emptiness and in order to deliver all beings, you're going to make this vow. Now, why would you do that? You really have to think about that carefully. Why would you do such an outrageous thing from where you are now, from a standing start? from your normal view, it has to be faith, doesn't it? You have to have met someone who has that conviction and manages to convince you. How else would it happen? Somebody has to inspire you. You have to encounter that. You see it in somebody and... You see that conviction in them and their conviction that you could do it. And somehow they communicate to you, you could do it, even though you don't understand how you could do it. But you can make that aspiration and it's worth doing. And you can make it, you know, I'll, I'll be the witness to you doing it and it will be real. And, it, oh, 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 you know, this is the Bodhisattva that we're talking about. And if you approach it with trepidation, you, well, might you indeed. And when you see them being given out very easily to people, you think, what do they think they're doing? But nonetheless, you know, maybe if I could see really the causes and effects of karma, it is so difficult to get to the point where you even do it at all, even if you're not. You, know, you may be doing it almost by accident because you happened to be in the room when the Lama was giving the the uh, ceremony and you said, well, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And you might say, well, what good does that do? But if you could, if I mean, I can't see, but presumably if you could see, you would realise even that is very rare and very difficult to get to that point. So by taking it in this way, almost by accident, you actually create the conditions for another time to get the opportunity and maybe the next time you will really take it with much more sense of what you're doing. This is, I know this is how Tibetans think, that's why they give these things so lightly. Because they think, well, this is a start. Next time round, this will ripen in you having an opportunity in which you will take even more, you know, you will be able to take even more advantage of the situation. That's what they think. So, and that's the logic behind why and then for us, sometimes we think, well, if you give people, people come away from the end and they walk in the door and they're given the Bodhisattva vow and they don't know what it was, surely that's made it seem less special and less interesting. Now they might think, well, that's not, there's nothing much to that. I had one of those before. You know, they might actually lose. My worry would be people would lose interest because they'd think it, was, it wasn't special enough there wasn't enough preparation there wasn't it wasn't treated as if it was something as momentous as it is so that uh, different teachers adopt different methods for different you know from depending on how they think would be the most skillful way of teaching so just because one teacher teaches differently from another you can't you know you have to realize understand the whole context within which they're teaching which I think is really is an important point. But um, going back to the virya, you can't have the energy needed 
to persevere to the point of complete and perfect Buddhahood if from the very beginning you don't have that intention. So that's the first kind of virya. It's called the armor because once you've got that intention and you've made that commitment and you know you always keep your word it's like you've put on armor that will protect you from any weakening of that intention because you you mean it when you give your word you mean it and you have now said to the whole every being that ever existed you have told them I am going to stick by you and I'm going to help you until you not only come out of the lower realms, not only till you've kind of had a human birth, but until you have actually realized complete and perfect enlightenment, I am going to be there for each and every one of you. Wow. So once you've committed yourself to that, think of the energy in that. I mean, that energy is going to carry on until every being is delivered from samsara. And only a mind, only your mind has that amount of power and energy in it. Nothing but a mind can do that. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's the power of the mind could do that, can make an intention like that and see it through. I think you might be beginning to see why keeping an open mind about future lives might be a good idea because uh, this if you haven't got the context of future lives then you how could that make any sense you know in other worlds how could that make any sense because beings in this world and when our body's gone that's the end of what we can do but from this point of view it's kind of irrelevant how this life is kind of irrelevant because okay it's going to end sometime and in the in the context of eternity it's not very long i mean it's like a blink of an eye even if you lived for 300 years it would be a blink of an eye in fact however long you lived it would be a blink of an eye in, in the in relationship to eternity so you're getting right outside of that very small type where we tend to think in the west into yeah into, you really have to change gears. It's a huge change in gear, moving from into this determination to realize complete enlightenment for the sake of all beings. But the release of energy is unbelievable. It's, it's, I mean, it's just unbelievable how much energy there is in that. And then as a basis then for... Well, I was going to say for meditation, but what happens is when conviction in that vision and, and that commitment is strong enough well the two feed into each other but a, a real revulsion for everything that's stopping that develops and this is a this is regarded as a huge spiritual accomplishment to have real genuine revulsion I mean, we think, oh, that does, that sounds really like what we're trying to avoid. But actually, it's the, it's the other side of the energy that's orientated towards enlightenment for all beings is an absolute revulsion for everything that opposes it. So you hate samsara. You hate everything that is actually causing beings to suffer more. And of course... That's our own clashes, our own, you know, greed, hate and delusion, if you like, or our own lack of wholesomeness and skillfulness and lack of awareness, attachment to stupid and wrong views that are clearly, you know, which are not right and not being able to, letting ourselves be distracted by things that actually take, use up the time we have to practice and we're letting ourselves be distracted. You can't bear to do, be distracted. Because it's such, it's so important what you're doing. So there's a joy in that. It's not like, oh, I'm having, you know, I've got to make all these sacrifices. It's like you have such joy for the practice of dharma that you just, you, you just automatically, without effort, really, reject what is not going to be conducive to the dharma. So you become very integrated. And, in, and full of joy and enthusiasm, very powerful. 
But it doesn't mean that you have to have a narrow view about what Dharma is. As I said, laziness would be not laziness. One of the kinds of laziness is that you don't allow yourself to rest. Which I think is quite interesting. You don't allow yourself to rest because your mind is so distracted all the time by all the things that you think are important that aren't. And that's laziness. It's quite nice, isn't it? Because mm. I think some of us, you know, I recognize it in myself. I have a great fear of laziness, but it comes from, I don't know, sort of sense that I should always be doing something. I, I mean, I can hear my mother saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You know, oh, get off my back. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. <laughs> so that it had a good effect in some sense because I've put it to good use. But and I might have just, you know, not used it very, to any good use. And even then, I still need to learn that resting is not lazy you know like when you're when you're at rest when you're at peace when you're just contemplating the dharma you're contemplating the nature of reality even now, even if it's not a dharma session because you know if you sat here formally you sort of feel well i am doing something even though i'm not if you see what i mean but outside of that you might think oh well you know i'm not doing anything when actually you are because you are actually, in a sense, you are thinking about the Dharma. You are thinking about, you know, kindness and about helping people. Or, and you could do it in a restful way, just being with somebody. Or even if there's nobody there, just being with yourself. That isn't laziness. So having emphasized how we have this tre tremendous enthusiasm for Dharma and we're not going to waste any time at all, and now I want to balance it with we learn how to do, you know, to rest really, not doing anything. And this is our virya that allows us to do it. It is because we have developed enough enthusiasm for Dharma that we can actually rest in it. We have enough energy going that we can rest in that energy without getting distracted. If you see what I mean. Because our mind isn't going to go anywhere else. Because, yeah, we've got enough energy. It's almost like you can ride your own energy. because It's now freed up enough for you to just be able to rest and it will take you towards what's conducive to dharma without any further effort you know you don't need to put any ego effort into it you can just ride the energy that's developed from this mandala really it's your mandala has become empowered by the dharma or you've become possessed by the dharma even if if even if only a bit so that there is an opportunity then that you could practice Dharma completely effortlessly without any ego effort or without any stress. Just be able to rest in the, the Dharma and that the, the generosity would flow naturally, the discipline would flow naturally, the, the patience would flow naturally and the energy would be augmenting all the time so you would not be distracted by anything and so the meditation would flow naturally so it's not so much about action as about embodying yes it's about embodying the dharma exactly that's exactly what happens so that's why i'm sort of warning you about the language because sometimes when i've looked at the six parameters in the past the language has sounded very, as um, Sean says, kind of quite Victorian, actually Victorian it is, of, you know, like judgmental, virtuous, being good. Whereas actually the real connotation of them is, yeah, exactly that, embodying the Dharma. And, and then the last one actually, which is actually included in all of them, is the prajna parameter which you know obviously i'll talk about in a couple 
couple of months time but in a way in a funny way it's not that difficult to get a, a little bit of an instance little say a little bit or even sometimes a lot glimpse into the nature of emptiness what's difficult is sustaining it stabilizing it so that's why the jhana jhana comes before or samadhi whichever word you use comes before the prajna but in fact when prajna comes through it comes through getting the, the view transmitted to you somehow or other which is relatively easy funnily enough but if there isn't that down quality there if that ground isn't there it just bounces off you you know you write a poem about it and then it's gone it's relatively easy to write a poem about it compared with really realizing it because really realizing it means that you your whole world changes you completely change and then you embody you embody that that is what you are you're you're nothing other than that even to the point you probably couldn't even talk about it anymore because you don't you don't see anything other than the than that reality of complete emptiness and whatever everything that implies so i think it's good to have a a really big open view towards the whole thing and recognize everything you do that might seem to you quite small and insignificant has a context that is you know it's it's going to transform everything it's going to transform the universe for everybody it's like way beyond anything that we could imagine to start with and i'm talking about that now i suppose because after practicing all these decades it's dawning on me what i've got what I've got myself into. <laughs> I didn't start off like that. But then I'm thinking, if only I had. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to tell you all, you know, <laughs> but of course it's probably, you know, I don't no idea what effect it's having on you all because, you know, it depends where you are in relationship to, to what I'm saying. But at least I'm giving you a chance to get a little bit of a flavour of what eventually starts to come through um, and in the meantime also I hope it gives you a little sense that even what seems to me like a very small thing that I'm doing could have these um, unimaginable consequences so I might think to myself I think I will take refuge I think it's the right moment and I think I feel better for doing that and I think I really more or less understand it and then you might think you know, who am I to be saying that? I don't really know any of this. Or even the Bodhisattva Vow, even more so. Uh, and I'm saying, no, do it, do it. <laughs> do it when, when, you, when you feel that sense of, of inspiration, because it's not going to be wasted. It's going to be the start. And, and it, it will actually, the, the, the effect of that will be that your virya will be affected by it. You will find more energy to practice Dharma. So let yourself be inspired and do things which you think might be, um, um, well, I'm open to it, but I really don't know what, I, what this is. I think, yes, go for it, because it's the only way forward, really. So um, I departed from my text a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> How long have I been talking? So I could just ask for some questions. Well, I sat at half past two, so I've been going for an hour and a half, haven't I? So does anybody want to finish now? Or do want, does anyone have a question? Or If there's no questions, we could finish. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I was just a bit interested when you said, just, I mean, a few moments ago, about then you would, may reach the point where you embody it completely even to the point that you wouldn't want to talk about it or you'd be you wouldn't even be able to talk, talk about, about it, it. Mm. so i was just was wondering what that meant because how does that fit with teachers from the past and that that, that sort of thing? it's why you have to ask teachers to teach 
I mean, the oh. Buddha, the Buddha didn't say, oh, well, I'll go and teach this. He thought, oh, you know, there's no way I could teach this. He wasn't going to teach. That's why we keep asking the teachers to teach, because it's a condition. You know, there you are, you're enlightened. You think you're the only idiot in the universe who's taken this long to get there. But you see all these other beings and you think, well, if they can't see it, I don't know what I can do to help them. And then they come and they say to you, please teach us. And you think, what on earth am I going to say? You know, like, they're not going to understand it. And they beg you again, they beg you again. And then you think, well, maybe if I say this, this will help. And it does help. And then, well, okay, well, maybe I'll say something else. And then the Dharma starts to flow, flow out from them in response to the, the, the beings around who are asking for it and hearing it and listening then that draws it out to to the level of the people around you. So that's why the Sangha is so important, really, for drawing out the teachers teachings from the teachers. It's that the energy exchange. It's exactly that. It's the five certainties. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm not. Yeah, you know, that's why I I have this great enthusiasm for Sangha because the five certainties is that the Dharma emerges from the teacher when. And the teaching emerges from the teacher in accordance with the request and the, the needs of the people around them. And then that starts this whole mandala of the Buddha teaching. And this is what we need more than anything in the West. For that to, and for me, what seems really important is that the Dharma goes in. If we're going to have it established here in the West, if you just go somewhere and you give a talk and some people will be affected by it and other people but you don't see those people again, you can't actually, you, you can't actually respond to the next step of what that person needs, which is where my enthusiasm lies. You know, like having given you some level of teaching, then I see it's gone in, and then you're asking me more questions. I, and then I have more enthusiasm to go further. So that's, uh, and it really does work like that, doesn't it? Oh, this is your taxi. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay, so well, I uh, hope to see you again sometime. Good luck with your journeys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, perfect timing. There you are. Mm -hmm. I stopped just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Would there like more questions? Is there any more questions? Perhaps people have heard enough for now. It's rather long already, isn't it? <laughs> I'm told that people can't actually concentrate for more than 20 minutes. <laughs> so you're well over the limit. <laughs> we dedicate this punya to the enlightenment of all sentient beings. May all sentient beings realize complete and perfect awakening. May the heart's awareness awaken the unawakened. Where it has begun to stir, may it never fade, and may it awaken fully. Changes and then Kemp and Bridget is on the What page is that? E forty three. Radiance of intelligence, skillful play. You are a fertile field of excellent qualities. You manifest an ocean of dhammas with each point clear and distinct. 
In all ten directions the melodious sound of your song reverberates. You sing the songs of the deep meaning of the view and meditation. Genuine and spiritual friend, may your feet continue the playful dance. We beg you to always remain. Then we can do it into Bethany. Oh, great. Hello, everybody. Oh, Dashu. Hello. <laughs> and Rose, of course. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Great. Good. So um, now it's tea time. <laughs> Official tea time. And I can do some interview. One more interview. Yeah.